Now that I've been interrupted twice, not that you're aware of it, I actually start, started recording and stopped twice because of uh, interruptions rather than go back and try and edit out the like several minutes of being interrupted. Let's try this again, shall we? This is the miscellaneous section and leading up to the last section, which will have its own video, actually, because th that might be some talk. I might actually wait on that last bit. But anyways, all right. First question. Do you watch the show Game of Thrones, and if so, do you think it is a modern masterpiece? Now, as I just said, not that you heard, I do not. Uh, I generally don't watch TV uh, in general, especially these days. I don't have the facility, per se. I don't actually own a television. What I own is a computer <laughs> and a very nice monitor and a text message, apparently. And so I don't actually watch TV generally at all, and especially finding the time to sit and watch a TV piece, a TV show is more difficult to do than anything else involved, because any time I would have the time at home to watch TV, I should be doing other things. And so, no, I have not picked it up. Uh, that's nothing against the show. In fact, quite the contrary. I have heard nothing but good things about it. And a friend of mine says it is a very political intrigue type thing in the good way, in the properly done way. And I tend to get into that sort of thing in a fictional sense. When, whenever it happens in real life, I want to slug people. But in a fictional sense, when that's happening in a, in a story, that's a very fascinating f type of story to me, and so I do enjoy that sort of thing. But let's move on here. Uh, let's see here. What are your thoughts about the never-ending circle of reboots, retcons, and in superhero comics? I think they completely detract from the, the comics and the stories and everything within them. I think they're a terrible idea, and I think there is nothing good to be said about them whatsoever. Let me give you a very direct example here of what I'm talking about. When Captain America died, I cried. And I admit this freely, I, I actually shed tears. That was such a beautifully done scene, the whole lead-up to it. The, the Civil War arc had its ups and downs, but right there at the finale was amazing. And Tony Stark, you know, kneeling there, holding the body, it wasn't worth it, it wasn't worth it. It was just, oh, it was heart-rending, it was tear-inducing. Tear then they completely undid all of that and turned it into a joke. Tur turned one of the most amazing moments in comic history into a joke by having him leap, quantum leap through his own history and past and, and doing the other dimension and... Oh my god, it was terrible. It was awful. It was abysmal. I can't believe they did that. I don't have a word sufficient enough to explain how much of a crime it was that they took such an amazing story and turned it into that. You know, I, I mean, that's right up there with, like, say, the, the pinnacle scene when Darth Vader finally chooses his son over his over his master and, and flings the Emperor over the, the pit. That would be like adding no to that scene. That would just take away from it. So wait, wait. Hang on. That sounds familiar. Uh, anyways. <laughs> but no, in all seriousness, that was just terrible, and I can't believe they did that. I. And it's not the only time they've done that. You know, it, let's, let's, just, let's not even talk about uh, One More Day or One Last Day or whatever it's called for Spider-Man. Ugh. Moving on. Uh, do you make that chku sound chku sound every time you switch something off? Yes, I do. I do that very much by habit these days. It's been I did that for too many years, and uh, it it's it got stuck. We're up with saying nuclear when I'm trying to say nuclear. It's it's just a habit, and I've never been able to break it. And so, you know, it, it was kind of funny when I started doing these videos. I actually noticed I was doing the chku. I was like, shoot, I need to make myself stop doing that. And so I started making, you know, the, the, the solid effort not to do that. And then my sister was like, why aren't you doing the ch Well, because I was trying to stop. Well, don't stop! <laughs> so now I just kind of let myself do it naturally. Because, like I said, I really don't even think about it. Um, next question here. Do I even play the lottery? Yes, I do. And I'm going to explain very briefly why I do. First of all, the expense of buying one ticket every time the lottery is up is minuscule to the point where it but it doesn't even register on my budget. It registers as uh, runoff flow, basically. So, not even a concern. And on top of that, what that does is it changes something from absolutely impossible, that is to say, mathematically speaking, 0%, to any percent, which by definition is infinitely greater than 0%. Now, you may be calling me out on it technically, but that's not a technically. That it Technically, in fact, I'm not sure how it technically would apply to that. No, no. The point here is that it changes something that is not possible to something that is possible. It's not statistically probable, and it is very, very likely that I will never win the lottery in my lifetime. But it is a potential. It is something that is available now because, uh, because of that, because I, I have opened that door, so to speak, and so that would be why I do it. Um, next question. I, I guess I sort of already answered this. How often do you play the lottery? Every time it's up. Uh, twice a week here, where I live. 
And like I said, it's such a minis minuscule expense, so I make, sure, make a point of doing it every time I can. Uh, let's see here. Next question. Did you ever watch the Firefly show or the Serenity film? Yes and yes. Uh, did I enjoy both? No and yes. I've never really had a way of explaining why I didn't like Firefly. I, I really don't to this day. I mean, obviously I don't like the Reavers, but thats I, I don't think anybody likes them. <laughs> it, it, you know what I mean. I, uh... Something about the show... It was so strange, because even now, looking at Firefly, I see a well-acted, well-produced, well-directed, well-written show that just doesn't have anything for me. I look at it, and I just kind of stare at it, and I'm like, yeah... I, I do think it was a, cr a crime that the show was cancelled, and I think that's part of it. That is a, this is a very small part, but that is at least something to consider. Firefly just sort of ended, and it bothers the heck out of me when things don't finish, as I think I've mentioned before. It, it genuinely bothers me, and so the fact that Firefly... It has been long since announced that Firefly, he's not going back, that series has ended, is just criminal. Yeah, now, now I know Serenity did sort of end the series, and that might be why I enjoyed Serenity more, I think I enjoyed Serenity more because it was written for the perspective of someone who is familiar with the series, but isn't intimately familiar with it. You know, a lot of things were revealed and discussed and shown in Serenity, a lot of things. And basically all the answers were given there, with like very few exceptions. And so I, d and of course Serenity was extremely well done, and I did enjoy Serenity. Uh, except for like two or three scenes, so I, I got nothing. Um... I guess suppose that's it. Uh, let's see. Six. F what, if you knew today was your last day on Earth, how would you spend it? Um, well, I hope today is not my last day on Earth. I'm gonna. It's gonna be out in like six minutes here. Um, no, but seriously, that's an interesting question, because it's not like the you know end of the world situation where I can say, well, I can do something. There's nothing I can do, you know, to stop the end of the Earth. There's nothing I can do, or I'm sorry, not the end. Of, there's nothing I can do to stop my last day, you know, if, assuming this is my death we're talking about here. So I, would, I wouldn't tell anybody. I wouldn't tell a single soul. I would just try and spend my time with my friends and my family. I wouldn't go into work that day. I, I don't feel like wasting any more of, of what little precious time I have in existence here. But I would spend my time with my friends and my family and my loved ones, and I would make sure they knew unequivocally and without question, <laughs> and yes, I know I'm just repeating myself there, that I did care for them, that I'd love them, and I wanted them to, to... I would like them to remember me that way. <laughs> Rather than how, whatever horrible things they might remember me as. That's just my opinion. Uh, let's see. What are my opinion... Person, what is my personal opinion of the zombie apocalypse in 2012? And the rumors there, too. For anybody who doesn't know, there's a drug called bath salts. I uh, do not recommend you look it up, because it's disgusting and horrifying. <laughs> bath salts is one of those drugs that I don't understand in any level. I've never been into drugs, right? I've never, I never liked the thought of being out of control. I understand chemical dependency. I understand the the chemistry behind drugs, and I would never do that, right? For for many many reasons. Bath salts is the kind of thing that I have talked to people I know who are into drugs of some kind or another, and they have said there is no way in hell, heaven, or earth that they would ever do bath salts because those things really, really mess you up really badly. And uh, that's really... It, all those zombie stories that were happening were people who were either on bath salts or idiots who are trying to emulate. So, yeah. That's all I have to say about that. People equal what the hell? <laughs> next question. Uh, let's see here. Wait, what is the next question? Give me just a moment. Okay. Am I going to see Prometheus? Uh, no, I'm probably not. Well, I'm... I interpret this as, am I going to see into the theater? No. I don't have uh, time to do that, of course. I would like to see Prometheus eventually. As I've said, horror and terror aren't really my things, while I rec while I have... Which is kind of confusing, I'm sure, because I've spoken so highly of Alien, for example, the original. But... Or Silent Hill 2, for another example. But the truth is, while I recognize the, the amazingness and the potential of such stories, I don't actually enjoy them that much. And I've never actually enjoyed sitting down and watching Alien, for example. In fact, I've only watched it twice total, ever. But it, it's still an amazing film. It's still an incredible. It, it, it set the standard for horror, really, in so many different ways and for reasons I'm not going to go into. So Prometheus certainly has some potential, and, you know, I am looking forward to it, and I do want to watch it. I want to see where they go with that. But I am not going to, you know, run out and try and make time for it, especially since seeing something in the theaters at all is, is unlikely at the moment. 
Oh shoot, I need to update the file here, don't I? Give me one moment, please. I do apologize, I'm still trying to get my updates done in the background here. There we go. Next. Uh, what is the next question here? Um, if I jump around monkeying with timestamps, do you still get full credit for a view? You know, I have no idea. Uh, I tried looking it up and didn't get any coherent response. If anybody who actually knows YouTube or internet things uh, can they give me an answer on that, I would appreciate it. Because I have no idea if I get a view credit for people who use the timestamps and just look at one, one or two or three questions on these views. Um, do I think a Ruby re <laughs> reboot or remake could be done for the original Star Wars trilogy? And the person who was mentioning this mentioned several other things, like introducing Mara Jade, for example, or uh, going to Coruscant in the original trilogy, that kind of thing. Now, let's be honest. I do not think even a proper remake of the original Star Wars trilogy would turn out nearly as well as we would hope. I have always said many, many times that the original Star Wars has a certain appeal and charm to it that is very, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to replicate. And one of the things that I have long since felt is one of the most important things there is what I call the Farscape Factor. I actually have this phone in my hand right now, right? I can interact with it, I can do this, you know, all this sort of thing. And I, as an actor, know this is where that phone is. I, there's no... It, it, it's much easier, much smoother, much more uh, comparable in order to look at this phone, knowing this phone is here, you know, reading the unit and so thing and all that, right? Now, as an actor, if I have to have a CGI phone here, and I have to look at that and I have to try and emulate everything I just did, it's going to be so much more difficult, and it's, it's, it's not going to turn out right. And there's always just that little bit of oddness and the little bit of, well, we're just looking at CGI feeling, I, I don't have a better word for that, but it's always been something I felt, you know, even if something looks amazing CGI, it still looks like CGI. It always still looks like CGI. It just is good CGI. And so it, there's something different from that when you have interaction with a live person who's just like, you know, doing this thing. It, it, does, it loses something there. And Star Wars was done with models and puppets. And that worked. There was actually something there to, for people to interact with. And the sets were well designed and... You get my point. I've, and that's just one of many reasons why I don't think a remake would be done properly. Now, a reboot is a completely different uh, aspect. When I think of reboots that are done properly, I don't. there's a lot of reboots that have been done, and you know, not, not all of them have been good, but ones that have been done properly, ones that have actually really caught my attention. Battlestar Galactica was a properly done reboot, was a well-done reboot. Took, took the concept, took the base materials, the skeleton, Bare, bare minimum skeleton of the, of what existed before and said, all right, let's turn this into something else. Went a completely different direction with it and, you know, did it fairly well. Not a series I enjoyed that much, to be completely honest with you, but again, very much props to the series for being very well constructed, very well designed, and very well performed, very well acted, and very well written. You know, it was a great series, I just didn't like it that much personally. But Battlestar, you know, that that's what I think of when I think of proper reboot. Doing a reboot like that of Star Wars? Not not that specifically, but, you know, taking the concepts of Star Wars and turning it into a new story based on the base premises, that would be awesome if done right, and it would be so difficult to do right. And no matter what you did, people would complain. You'd have to kind of live with that. You'd have to be like, all right, people are going to hate this movie and, and re yell and rant and whine, but we're, we're still going to do it, and hopefully people will still like it. You know, some people, enough people. That's just my opinion. And as far as how I would do a reboot, I'd have to really think about that one, so I'm not going to answer that tonight, especially since my my throat is slowly going over the course of the night, and I still got several questions to go through. So, moving on, why do I have long hair? Now, that's an interesting question. Uh, aesthetically speaking, I've always preferred long hair. I don't really have a reason why. Uh, I, I like long hair, and uh, I like having long hair. I like the fact that when I was driving to work today with my window open, my hair was doing this thing. This is really badly imitating, but you know, it was just flying out the window and all that. And I enjoy it, and I have no intention of cutting it unless, of course, I have to in order to reboot. But I'm not even going to go into that. Uh, let's see here. What is... <laughs> okay, next question. What are my favorite... What is? Who is my favorite voice actor? When I, when I first got this, I started sitting down, and I started typing out all the different voice actors 
you know, that I considered the absolute base, you know, favorite voice actors. And when I looked back and saw it, I was up to about 22 people. I decided I'm not going to do that. There are too many really good voice actors to really narrow it down to favorite. I just can't do that. There are so many of them. So I'm just going to give special mention to a few. Chris Metzen, who was basically responsible for bringing a lot of the Warcraft series alive. Uh, and when I live, I mean, you know, really adding life to it, really adding emotion and depth to it. Good voice actor. Bill Roper. I have to give props to the man for voice acting 100% of Warcraft 1 and like 80% of Warcraft 2 and Diablo 1 and several key roles in Diablo 2. Um, David Warner, who has only done a few roles, but every time he has done them, it has been amazing. And David Warner is the reason, basically in a nutshell, why John Olitherenicus is one of my favorite villains of all time. And finally, and this one's probably going to surprise people, Billy Zane, who, to my knowledge, has only done one voice acting role ever, but that was enough. I really wish they hadn't replaced him for that role in future games, because he nailed that line, th that role so absolutely perfectly. To this day, I still picture his voice when I think of that character. To this day... I, I still think of that as the embodiment of what I would want my villainous voice to sound like. That in the Overmind from StarCraft. You know, I, I would love that. I would love to sound like that. I wish my voice sounded like that. I really do. Oh, I wish I wasn't losing my voice. Holy crud. I'm probably going to wake up with a sore throat tomorrow. Um, so, special mention to those, and of course, dozens upon dozens upon dozens of others. Next question. Who do I, what do I think of Voldemort? I've always said Voldemort is an interesting and an in engaging villain, because he's not that complicated, ultimately. He's not that, you know, in-depth. There's not a lot to him. And he's not stupid, either, though. He is very intelligent. He's, in fact, brilliant. A genius, one might say. The catch is, in D&D &D terms, while his int is through the roof, his wisdom is like three. And so he makes mistakes constantly. But the thing I like about it is it always... Well, there's two things I like about it. One, it always makes sense. Every time he makes a mistake and is beaten, it, it, isn't, it doesn't feel overdone. It doesn't feel deus ex machina. It doesn't feel anything. It feels like, you know, a natural progression of exactly how things should go. It feels like Voldemort should have lost, but he shouldn't... But he also lost barely, you know. He just barely got defeated. And that leads me into the second point, which is, despite all his mistakes, his dozens upon dozens of mistakes, Voldemort still came this close to winning... And I like that, because Voldemort was simply that powerful. Despite everything, despite so much united against him, despite all the powers, all the knowledge, all the effort, all the in influence against him, Voldemort still came within a hair's breadth of winning, because he was just that strong. And I like that kind of villain when done properly. Another example of that, probably the uh, Ur example that actually, if I were to say uh, so personally, would be the guy whose name I can't think of right now. Give me just a moment. I, I You know what? Screw it. I'm going to look it up. <sighs> I'm sorry. It's getting late and I'm getting tired. Luca Blight from Suikoden 2 is who I'm thinking of. Luca Blight was not that, in, was not that you know, complicated. He was not that in-depth. There wasn't a lot to him. He was just a bad guy. He was a villain. With, with basically an irredeemable villain, just like Voldemort is. And they were both just that much, you know, just that strong, just that over the top, and in both cases, you know, awesome. So I like I liked Voldemort. I thought he was a very interesting villain, a very one of one of the better villains, especially of that type of recent era. Now, this question is interesting. You know, give me a moment here. God, I really am losing my throat. The question is phrased: What is your favorite hero? And by hero, I mean a serious, hardworking, suffering person who is honestly fighting for something worthwhile. The gentleman in question was was asking this in reference to me mentioning that Mario was what I call a true hero because of you know the Mario effect as I've explained before I'm not going to explain again here, um, and he was asking what is my favorite as far as a you know a, a hero who is more down to earth basically and he uh, he mentioned Solid Snake and Max Payne as possible examples of this now whether or not that is a a, a hero is something that is, is irrelevant to debate here. What I do want to say is I do have someone of that that I can mention. And that would be James Rayner. Uh, if you don't know who that is, that is basically the hero of the StarCraft series. James Rayner is the embodiment of awesome, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and but, but on top of that, he is not the Mario. He, he can't be the Mario. He does not have the power 
Need that because being the Mario Mario requires a level of power, a level of confidence, and a level of ability that is basically above and beyond literally everything else in your particular setting, which Rainer is not. He's just a guy. But despite being just a guy, he never gave up, never surrendered, never quit, kept going, kept striving. He got spit on and chewed up and ground down over and over and over, and he never actually stopped. He never actually quit and gave up, and he actually ended up winning in the end, which was awesome. And uh, we'll see how that story continues, of course, when StarCraft 2.2 comes out, which I'm very much looking forward to. But James Raynor, that would, be, that would definitely be my answer there. Now, would I consider Starkiller from the Force Unleashed series as a Grey Jedi? No. And I have a very specific reason for this. I, I guess you could call it technically on this one, that he is technically a Grey Jedi. In my honest-to-God genuine opinion, I don't mean this as an insult, by the way, I think of Starkiller as a tool, not a person. I don't e even in le even in lore, even in setting. I bl I think I look at Starkiller and I see something that is a droid, basically, except less than a droid, even because even droids, I've always said, have a degree of personal rights within the Star Wars setting. Sorry, um, Starkiller is a tool. He is he is a blunt instrument intended to be utilized, and he is a blunt instrument that got away from him. You know, he's, he's a rabid dog, I suppose you could put it in such terms. But if you get my point here, I don't consider someone like that someone who could be a light or dark or gray Jedi. I consider him to be an object. And I'm not saying that as a bad thing. I'm not saying as an insult. Quite the contrary. I think that was exactly what the story needed. For someone who is simply that powerful, making them someone who essentially has no genuine long-term goals or motives of their own made a lot of sense to me. And, you know, fits with the canon, so hey, I'm with that. Uh, speaking of Star Wars, next question. What are your thoughts of the Jedi Council in the Star Wars movies? Well, after I grind them all up to a little gooey paste and smear them across Coruscant... No, I... <laughs> that's probably more graphic than I wanted to be, but the point is, the Jedi Council in, in the Star Wars prequels really... Em and, and I think this was well done, mind you. I think they should have been this way. But they really emphasized everything that was wrong with the Jedi Order. Uh, all the way back in, through the through, through the heydays of the old Republic era, everything that was everything I just talked about in the Kotor and the Kotor two reviews, primarily the Kotor review, about how the Jedi Order is wrong, about how their laws are incorrect, about how they just are making things worse, uh, is exemplified by the the Council a lot in the prequels. It is emphasized over and over again, and it is done properly. I think it was it was something that should have been there. It's something I don't you know I I agree with that being in those movies. Uh, as frustrating as it is, because that is is correct. The Jedi Council was wrong, and said and was c repeatedly wrong, and so you know, very very well done. But you know, <laughs> nothing else to say there. Now, next question tied into that: Do I see Yoda, in particular, as a Jedi who did not think in the old ways and knew the Jedi laws were wrong and helping the dead side, the dark side, the dead side? Um, or do I think that Yoda was actually in the wrong? Now, I think personally, for two reasons. Yoda actually did believe in the old ways. Yoda actually was someone who followed the code and believed in the Jedi teachings and all that. And the reason for that is, you know, like I said, twofold. One, because in the in the novelization of Episode Three, uh, that that's the case. Yoda was wrong, and it's actually a very powerful moment when Yoda realizes he's wrong because it happens while he's fighting Palpatine. During the fight, it's, it just kind of occurs to him. This whole time, they'd been preaching the same teachings that they had been preaching for 2,000 years, and the Sith this whole time had been adapting and learning and growing, and the code doesn't allow learning or growing a code or anything like that. And he, Yoda realizes not just that the Jedi were wrong, but that he personally was wrong. And there's this beautiful line, which was, which is not in the movie, where he's he gets on the the speeder as he's escaping with with uh, Bail Organa. And or was it wasn't Bail? Was it Organa, the guy? And the Organa says, "Are you hurt?" And Yoda's response is, "Only my pride." And I loved that, because he, he's honest enough to admit it, and he's also honest enough to himself to, real, to, to truly open up and see how absolutely wrong he had been. And I loved that, and that leads me very much into the second reason why I think, he, this, think this was the truth, because that adds so much to the character of Yoda. It really helps flesh him out, rather than him always being right, rather than him always being the wise and, char and you know, knowledgeable individual. 
he was wrong and like a true wise man acknowledges that he was wrong acknowledges that he knew nothing realizes his mistakes and tries to learn from them and tries to grow from them and understand from them and that moment when he loses to Palpatine he didn't just lose the fight he lost the war that day to Palpatine and he acknowledged that and understood that and that's a, just such a pivotal character pivotal character moment for Yoda. So that would be the two reasons uh, why I think that's sorry for rambling on a bit there. Uh, let's see. Do I watch the Clone Wars series? I'm not sure if you're talking about the cartoon series, which only ran for a few episodes, or the CGI series, which recently started, and I believe is still going. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, yes and no, respectively. I did watch some of the CGI Clone Wars series. I didn't... The CGI Clone Wars series strikes... Oh, shoot. No, no, no. feel like making another edit. Edits tick forever to do on this poor laptop, especially given how long these movies are. As I was saying, <laughs> uh, it's very much like a lot of other TV shows tend to be, or indeed comic books. As I, s I was talking about comic books the other Q&A, I said it depends on the writer, right? No, I like this character, depending on the writer. I like this story arc, depending on the writer. And it it's very much seems to be the same case with uh, the, the new Clone Wars series, because some of the plots, some of the episodes are just kind of bad. You know, they're they're kind of a little too cartoony, and I don't mean visually, I mean, you know, in, in concept and style. A little too kid-like, a little too happy-go-lucky or whatever. And just don't carry the seriousness or the reality of the situation the way they should. But then, some of them are very well written, some of them are very well designed, some of them act actually take into account intricacies and, and plots and, and the way that the story should evolve, and some of them are really good, so I guess yes and no is kind of my answer here. It depends, you know. Ultimately, one of these days, I need to go back and actually watch the whole series all the way through so I can get all those good episodes and, you know, enjoy them. <laughs> Next question. Do you have a top five face palms for movies and TV? Now, I did have to think about this one for a bit. This is probably not my actual top five, but just more or less off the top of my head. And by top of my head, I mean thinking about it for a bit. Jar Jar Binks, in his entirety, just, just why, didn't need to exist at all. Neelix on Star Trek Voyager. Now, nothing against uh, Ethan Phillips, who was a good actor. Every time they had a, a, a writer who actually knew, the, knew what they were doing with Neelix on Star Trek, or on, on Voyager, it was a good episode. It was well done, and it was an interesting character. But 99% of the time it wasn't, because they were the writing was idiotic for him. They could have made him such a magnificent character, and they didn't third one, uh, Enterprise Season 1 in its entirety. If you want the exact moment, it would be the first time I saw the credit scroll going, and rather than hearing Jerry Goldsmith pouring liquid awesome into my ears, what instead I hear is something that sounds like Days of Our Lives, or Home Al or not Home Alone, uh, Home Improvement, or something like that music starting up, while some guy's like, I will go and do the thing, da da ba da ba ba and I'm just, uh, I was literally sitting there, I remember when Enterprise came out, very first, you know, very first episode, as it was premiering, I'm just sitting there, utterly shocked, utterly spellbound, by how terrible it was, and the episode was terrible, too, and all of season one was terrible. Moving on, and uh, my final thing is kind of generic, that would be the, the inexplicable, inscrutable desire of TV executives to cancel amazing shows, uh, especially ones that start with F. I, I don't know if anyone else has noticed that trend, but we've had Family Guy, Farscape, Futurama, and uh, Firefly. All were canceled within like two years of each other, too. It's just, what the heck is wrong with you people? Do you not notice quality? Do you not understand what quality is? I suppose that's possible. Next question, uh, still on TV here. Are you a fan of the Venture Brothers show? I am not a fan of the Venture Brothers show. I was exposed to a fairly large amount of it thanks to my friend having it on basically constantly when he was my roommate. There were a few amusing scenes, and there were a few th things I liked about the show, but overall, I didn't actually enjoy it at all. There was on only one scene I can remember to date that I really, really liked in that whole show, and that was uh, when the two kids had been cloned and they were, like, flopping about, 
and the one necromancer was like, oh my god, what's going on? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, they've been dying over and over for years now. And um, they they show like this montage of the kids dying in horrifically gruesome ways. They don't show anything, of course, cartoon show. But that's correct. That, that's the way it should be done. You know, just horrible, horrible, horrible deaths. And then, it, and you know, and then it cuts to this one thing where the two kids are just sleeping in bed boy, silently. And then suddenly, the the guy comes with the voice actor. That one was a, a blah 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 gas, the silent killer. <laughs> um, but anyways, not really a huge fan. It's just every now and again that show had moments which were amusing to me. Have you tried the code Geass? Anime. I'm not actually. Uh, I don't remember how to pronounce it. Yes, I have. I have watched it a bit. Uh, let me let me make, just make this this statement clear really quick before I go for further. I I know I said I hate anime, and then I corrected myself and said I don't hate anime because I don't. What it is is statistically speaking, animes are things I don't tend to like. It has nothing to do with the fact that it is anime. If if you're with me here, it is the fact that it's a show that I tried that I ended up not liking. And statistically speaking, the vast majority of animes are animes I have not cared for. If you, if, so I suppose that could be applied to most shows in general if you want to get down to it. But uh, that's just the reality of it. So yes, uh, if you're going to name an anime you want me to ask about, or if you want me to answer whether I've tried or not, my answer is probably going to be very brief. Yes, I have, and no, I didn't like it because I've tried a lot. Uh, a lot of my friends are very big into anime, as indeed that tends to be the case, and so I have been exposed to a lot of it, and I don't like most of it. That's it's nothing against it. I want to stress, I, I'm not trying to be like anime is terrible, but for the most part, just not my thing, you know. Ah, next question, completely off topic here. What is your general opinion on classical and canonical liter literature, such as Faulkner, uh, Shakespeare, Joyce, Melville, etc., and that type of uh, literature that is studied in academia? Or academicia, if you prefer. I am of a weird mind on this one, because I do think that kind of thing should be studied. I do think that sort of thing should be a part of education. I am gl glad that it was a part of mine, and I ended up looking into it more. I do, or at least I did. It's been a while. But at, once, at one point in time, I could actually speak and, and more properly write Old English, actual Old English, you know, not Old Day English, -ay, but actual Old English and the old prose and the old style. And if I really sit my mind to it, I can do that still to this day, and I kind of prefer that type of talking. I don't know why, it's just a weird thing with me. All of that being said, I can't actually name any one of those old pieces I actually enjoyed on the face of it, you know, like a one of those written works that I really actually got into. Rather, I found them fascinating. I found them interesting test studies. Uh, and it was it was such an interesting insight into the in the life and times of the era and the way things worked back then. Because you always have to take something into account with the era it's in. You know, you have to consider the 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 audience, the the, the intended audience, I should say, the actual audiences. The uh, the the figures of speech. That's the word I'm going. The figures of speech that are utilized. The importance of certain aspects of things, with, uh, culturally speaking, societally speaking. You know, these things all have always been fascinating to me. And so, while I can't say that there's a single uh, old work that I actually enjoyed, I find them absolutely invigorating to read and, and to study. And I did back in the day, and I do encourage people to do that now, if you can, you know, if you can manage it now. Ah, oh, where are we at? Next question. Would you consider doing book, film, music, or other non-video game reviews and discussions? No tangentially, or I should say no provis provisionally. Gosh, my words are leaving me. My throat's getting worse. Ah. Oh. No, but only for one very big reason, and that is time. As is, I barely have time to get these Q&As done. These take up so much time, prep work and anal analysis and editing and then uh, posting and all that stuff. It just takes forever in order to do all these things. I'm not complaining. I'm just stating fact. I am basically at my limit time-wise right now. And as, as you probably noticed, I tend to spend more time on these Q&As than I do on the actual video game reviews. I will not be getting a video game review done this week. Uh, so I'm glad I already got that bundle of KOTORs and, and Baldur's Gate done this week. Oh, excuse me. So, no, I don't think I'll be adding that. But there's also another very good reason for that. I'm not sh I want to have a degree of expertise and knowledge about the things I talk about, especially for my actual reviews. And there's a very few things I could actually speak with at length, uh, with authority on, that I would do that for. There are things like that, of course, but not that too many. Um, 
And, uh, okay, I guess that's it, actually. There's, uh, there are four other questions, but I'm going to go ahead and put those in their own little video because they're all questions that are probably going to take me some time, and frankly, I want to let my throat rest a little bit. So I'm going to go let my throat rest a little bit, get some more water, and I'll see you guys in a bit, hopefully.